Optimal health for high performers. This is the Health Upgrade Podcast with Dr. Nawaz Habib. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Health Upgrade Podcast. I'm very, very excited about my guest today. It's Billy Anderson. Billy and I met um, a little while ago, a few, uh, about a year ago, and um, we're introduced to each other again at a conference in Los Angeles. And uh, what Billy does is really, really interesting. So Billy found the courage to stop doing what the world told him he should do. And instead, he started defining his own version of success and went after it. He started living the kind of life that made him jump out of bed in the morning and actually dance to the radio every day. He redefined success in terms of fun and fulfillment, and now he lives a life that's true to him while making a positive difference in the world as the founder of The Courage Crusade. And he's also the author of a wonderful book that your comfort zone is killing you. I'm super excited to introduce Billy. Thank you so much for being here, brother. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Amazing. So tell me a little bit about your story. I'd love to hear what you were experiencing. What were the challenges that you were experiencing that you felt were the things that you should do? And then how did you start to pull yourself out of that? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it just has to do like with everybody, sort of where we live or what kind of parents we have and what the expectations that come from them. And even more so the expectations that we think are coming from them, whether they're actually, they have those or not. And then the school we went to and, you know, people do this, or you want to do this, or you have to do this, or you only do this if you can't do this. So just a lot of expectations. And so kind of, I was kind of following that path. Um, And it was okay. It was fine, but I just wasn't as happy and fulfilled as I think we can be. Um, and that took a lot, that took a lot of courage. That was probably the biggest courageous thing I've done is just realizing like, wow, this path I'm on, which was corporate, I was in advertising, which isn't actually terribly corporate, but it's still kind of corporate. Uh, I was in advertising and just working on brands that I wasn't willing to work that hard for. And so I was, I just decided I'm not doing this anymore. That's the really short version. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great, great uh, story. And, and it, clearly defines the fact that you need to be resonating with uh, the work that you're doing. The work that you're doing needs to feel fulfilling. And I think that, um, as, as we stated in your intro, was something that you were looking for was fun and fulfillment. And obviously the advertising world didn't have that for you. What were you experiencing? What were the like signs that it wasn't going as well as you thought? Yeah, just the clearest sign was just, waking up one morning and sitting on the end of my bed and just being like, ah, oh, get up, go to work in the dark, come home in the dark. It must've been winter in Canada at the time. Um, so just like, just kind of like this, it would look like this kind of shuffling feet and just, uh, yeah, not having that zip, not feeling like I've got that s- spark in my step. And it was, it was, it was fun. Um, and that's probably what kept me in it even as long as I did. But it was realizing, oh, okay, fun is good, but fun without fulfillment, you just kind of need both. And so that was it. It was, it was a feeling, just a feeling of blah, or even what am I doing? I've always been a big thinker about the future and death and what am I going to think then? And that's kind of that's, that's what it was, just a feeling of blah. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I actually really appreciate that because um, in your course, um, which we'll talk about at the end of our uh, chat today, you talk a lot about, um, and you interview people asking if they know what the biggest regret people have is on their <clears throat> deathbed. And right. um, you kind of brought it up with what were you, what are you going to think of when you're mm-hmm. on your deathbed? What, what regrets will you have? And obviously for you at that point, that, that was not the regret you wanted to have. And so you were able to make that change. Tell me a little bit about that. The regret or the, or the change? Uh, the regret itself and, and what, what is that top regret that most people yeah. have? Yeah, yeah. So the number one regret people have, and this was from a study that was done in the U.S., is I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. And that's just exactly 
where I felt I was, was I was living this life that people expected of me. Uh, and that's the courage part. And people often think about courage in terms of physical stuff, like, and I've done all that stuff too. For days by yourself, you swim with sharks or the run into the bulls. You're not scared of anything. And that stuff is, I do that for fun. Um, and it's good to flex my courage muscle that way, but I'm way more interested in the day-to-day -day courage of, uh, you know, speaking up for yourself or just doing what you want to do or speaking up for someone else or saying you don't know or saying you need help or putting yourself first, I find is usually the, one of the biggest ones for people. I forget what your question was. Is that about where we were going? <laughs> So my question kind of focused on finding out what were the challenges that um, that people experienced and, and where where does that regret kind of come from? And right. I think for me, um, having that idea of the what others expect of you, where they where the expectation is coming from, um, you kind of alluded to it earlier. But where do you right. think most of these expectations are, are kind of uh brought up where where do these things kind of occur for most people right so there's two two ingredients one is uh evolution and evolutionary psychology and the other one is our expectations that our parents had or we think they had so the evolutionary one is huge which is you know for hundreds of thousands of years and even still today we need to be part of a tribe to belong or sorry we need to survive so we have to belong and so we've got this desperate, desperate need to belong that is literally programmed into us. So anything that might hurt our chances of belonging or being liked, like rocking the boat or just doing something different or having a difficult conversation or saying you disagree with something, um, that sets off every warning bell in us that says, no, 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 don't do this. You need to belong or you will die. And so that's, that's where that evolutionary thing comes in. And also, and even on a broader scope, for thousands, for millions of years, anything that was scary was probably gonna kill you. Mm -hmm. So we just evolved to avoid anything scary. Um, but our fears now are mostly not physical. Uh, they're more about social and career and all that. But again, our body, our brain is still telling us, don't do this. And then on the parent side, pretty straightforward, right? There's a, we want our parents love as kids and we always do. And we think we get in our mind accurate or not that, this is the way my, my one parent will love me. This is the way my other parent will love me. And we, we, we lock onto that and feel like we have to be that. Mm. <clears throat> and so those kind of muddle up um, living kind of true to ourself if, 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 if we want to do something slightly different than that. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very powerful thing. <laughs> so no wonder this stuff is hard. You've got millions of years of evolution and your entire childhood. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's where a lot of the struggle comes up for a lot of people that want to make a change or want to, um, that, that don't feel like they belong in the, the work that they're doing or that they just don't feel fulfilled with the, the, um, the work that they're doing on a daily basis, how they're spending their days. And it's a very common occurrence, I find that, um, people will, will take on this, uh, the emotional and the um, evolutionary toll that you were talking about and, and actually experience it in a very physical way. We actually experience mm. that, that evolutionary it. need to belong um, due to that need for survival. It was uh, yep. survival as being the, the big thing you talked about there. And for me, that comes down to that sympathetic response that our body creates where we start getting into that shallow breathing we start to have sweaty palms we start to sweat a little bit of sweat running down our back that feeling of uh worry that like eyes open wide pupils dilate all of those challenges are actual physical manifestation of that evolutionary need to belong to survive and totally. uh, this is where we have that that kind of intersection between uh, personal development, understanding the types of stressors that we're actually under right now and our body's response to them and actually understanding the physical and health-based things that we can do to optimize our ability to handle that stress. And so this is that intersection between personal development and overall yeah. health uh, that we can talk a little bit about. What what are some of the challenges? What are some of the, the most common um, symptoms you'll notice people experiencing when they get into that from a physical perspective. 
Yeah. So it's, it's funny. It's, it's the same as if we, so if it's a social sort of threat, so let's say you're, we're in a meeting and we kind of gap out zone out for a minute and then we hear our name and it's like, hmm. so right in that moment, you're responding to as if you walked out of your cave and heard a noise in the bush, you're opening your eyes to take in as much information as you can. People's nostrils flare to breathe in the scent and see what's going on. If we're really scared, we'll scream. And that's to maybe scare away what's coming at us or to draw attention to someone nearby who might be able to help us. And we usually back away and we close in to protect our vital organs and grab onto the first person who we can use as a shield. <laughs> so that's the extreme version, but our, yeah, our body reacts the same. And like you said, our temperature goes up, our palms get sweaty and we get tunnel vision in. What's so cool for me, and you know more about this than me, but for, for layman's terms is when we perceive a threat, when we get scared, the old part of our brain sends adrenaline to the smart part of our brain and it sends it there to shut it down. So we wonder why when we get feisty or scared, we can't think straight. And it's because your brain doesn't want you to. Because for hundreds of thousands of years, if you were in danger and you took a second to think you died. And that's why you, I maybe argue with my spouse, not that that ever happens. And I can't like think of something to say. And then 10 minutes later, the adrenaline's drained out and I'm smart again. I'm like, oh, if I had a sit, yes, <laughs> that would have put her in her place. Yeah. <laughs> so I love that stuff because it's, we're not as complicated. We're not as complicated as we think. I, I once heard uh, that your brain is scanning the environment five times a second for threats. And so we're, we live in this fancy online world and we're cavemen and cave women at heart and it's good to recognize that i call it few it's not just me because then people are like oh so there's nothing wrong with me this this is just the software the hardware i have to cope with yeah that's absolutely right um and and it's so interesting how we perceive these threats and and create this very specific response regardless of what that stress is whether it's physical stress from an evolutionary perspective, like a saber tooth tiger running at us, mm -hmm. or whether it's our name being called in a meeting when we've completely tuned out, we respond in that same way. We have that same immediate adrenaline response. And what that adrenaline creates in our body, like you said, is that distinction between the higher thinking brain that needs to shut off in that moment. Because if we think about it, we die and sending that blood to the hind brain where it's all about survival. And yep. that's what we uh, will experience are all of the symptoms of being under stress, even though the, the threat is not uh, a physical survival yep. based threat, we'll still experience it in that moment. And this is the same type of idea. Somebody's walking into a big meeting, for example, or their boss walks up behind them and calls them in and says, I need to talk to you at this moment. Like, we, we get that experience really, really quickly. Is there anything that we can do in that moment to help try to settle mm -hmm. our nerves, try to get into a more parasympathetic response, or, or at least try to uh, slow that fear-based response? Right. Yeah. So a couple of things, um, and I'm not a doctor by any means, but I know at all, actually. <laughs> but for number one is deep breath. Like number one is you just need to buy yourself some time. Yeah. So the deep breath does that, but also a deep breath down into your stomach. Obviously that's, and again, you can explain that better. So the deep breath helps. And then also just a little bit of time out. Um, and whether we ask for, Hey, you know, let me think about that for a second and I'll come back. Or as a speaker, I'll share a secret that I've used before. If I, if I'm ever given a talk and I get stumped with a question, I say, yeah, that's a great question. What do people think? And I pass it back to them. So whenever we're stumped or feel that fear, we're not sure what to do. Asking questions is a great response um, because it just gives your brain a second to kind of relax and think. And then if we've got the guts, we just say, actually, you know what? Let me think about that. That's important. I'll come back to it. But like often we want to look smart. So we want to, we feel like we got to say something right away. Yeah. I like that idea of being able to ask questions. And oftentimes we have this preconceived notion that asking a question in that moment, not answering it immediately is actually a sign of weakness. And I actually mm. don't find it to be a sign of weakness. I find it to be actually a moment of strength, a moment of 
of saying, yeah, I'm human. I need to think about this. I need to actually settle and come up with the right answer. And so taking that moment saying, hey, I'll, I'll get back to you. And I, I'm very honest with my patients when I'm speaking with them on our calls. If they ask me a question and I actually don't know the answer, I'll say, you know what? I actually don't know at this moment, but I'm going to do some research. I'm going to get back to you yeah. and I want to get you the best, most accurate information possible rather than just saying, yeah, you know, that, that ingredient in that supplement makes a right. lot of sense where I don't actually know. So I'm going to spend some time respect. to do that. Yeah, exactly. It is respect. I think for your client and really totally. a lot of respect for yourself and knowing that if you, you don't know all the answers and nobody knows all the answers and just being yeah. willing to say that. And I think that willingness to say it is where the courage really comes up. Big uh, let's start talking about courage and, and what kind of prompted you to get into founding the courage crusade. Sure. So yeah, originally it was, <clears throat> it was less about, courage and more about fear. Um, I'm an adrenaline junkie. And so I was doing all lots of those typical kind of scary things and really enjoying that. And then I started leading trips for outward bound. So wilderness trips with youth and with adults as well. Um, and just seeing people out of their comfort zones in the wilderness or sleeping by themselves for a night, it brought back down to the daily stuff the daily fears that we have and the daily courage that we need to call up if we want to grow and be the best version of ourselves, And so that's where I started to make, I'm still an adrenaline junkie, but it was it's that, that day-to-day -day application I find is so helpful. And I saw how much people need it mm -hmm. and knowing that it's, it's, it's not that complicated. So that just started the urge of, hang on, let's try to apply this to more everyday stuff that applies to everybody. Yeah. It, that's such a wonderful way to kind of go about it, to get yourself immersed in this whole new kind of uh, feeling and things that you love and just use your observations to understand that too many of us uh, stop ourselves from doing things that we perceive as scary, even though when we go through these things, they're either completely safe or the threat is actually significantly less than we initially had thought that it might be. Um, totally. I can, I can tell a fun story about this, uh, that yeah. involves both of us, um, <laughs> specifically in the, the LA, um, event that we were both at. So we were at this archangel event and, um, it was the last day. It was kind of the last, uh, last couple hours that the event was, uh, concluding and, uh, Billy plays the guitar uh, quite well. In fact, I'm, I'm quite impressed by your musical talents. Oh, and <laughs> I would say I'm musically inclined, but I definitely have not played an instrument in a very long time. Um, but uh, yourself and one of the other attendees were uh, getting up on stage to actually <clears throat> do a performance. And without even thinking about it, you asked me, because I was just the last person to Kind of be in that conversation with you you asked me do you want to come on stage too and i laughed and i said no why would i ever want to come on stage like what what reason do i have to get up there and you asked me a question you you said hey i have these tambourines i have these uh these instruments for you if you're if you're interested you don't have to do much you just have to like uh if, if you want you can just stand behind me you don't even have to play and then you asked me a question and that question really prompted everything. Do you remember what that question was that you asked me? Yeah, I think it would have been, I said something like, you know, when you go to bed tonight, you can say to yourself, I had a chance to be courageous and I chose not to, and that's okay. Or you can say I had the chance to be courageous and I was scared, but I pushed you into it anyway. Which would you rather say? Yeah, that was the exact <laughs> question. I remember that moment and I said to myself, a, Billy, I hate you for asking me such a simple question. <laughs> and B, I would much rather say to myself that I actually did it. And so I ended up getting up on stage with you and <laughs> now um, I'm lovingly referred to by many people as a tambourine man. <laughs> Are you? From that event. Yeah, uh, oh, there's a amazing. few people in Archangel that love to bring that up every so often. <laughs> well, and it was oh, so fun. And it wasn't just the courage for you to get up there and do it. The other thing that you did that was very courageous is you waited a long time before you played it, right? And so that means you just stood there doing nothing 
with this little tambourine that maybe people saw, maybe they didn't. And they were, pro you might have, I would have been thinking, okay, I got to play right away. Other guys, they're going to wonder what I'm doing up here. But you waited and you waited. And then when it came in, it was just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the the look you had when you turned back and, and you were like, I'm impressed. Your timing was impeccable. It and was yes, so, and I absolutely I, could have just stood there and done nothing. I was holding the tambourine behind my back on purpose. So most people didn't know what I was doing up there. And then so good. the timing worked out. Uh, so perfectly. good. And I, I was nervous to be up there, even though it didn't look like it, because I had never played this song. And so I was so focused on not screwing up that I'd actually forgotten you were there. <laughs> so then when the tambourine came out, I was like, what? Oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know what? You bring up a really interesting point there. You talked about you being... Um, as, as musically inclined as you are, you had the guitar with you, you knew kind of what was going on and you actually had played earlier in the day, um, but you still were nervous. Yeah. And, and this is something interesting that comes up for a lot of people. People think that those who get up on stage don't have these nervous cues, that they don't have these tics, they don't have these issues that come up. Um, you brought this up. I, I think these things are, are completely false. I think everybody yeah. that gets up on stage continuously has these. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, no, and that's a great point to bring up. So <clears throat> uh, courage is being scared and doing it anyway. So, you know, you can't be courageous unless you're scared. That's important for a lot of people to go to. Uh, but yeah, I get nervous. I get nervous every time. Um, even if it's something I've done a bunch of times, that time was more, more, normal to be scared because it was something new but no every single time um and again it all comes back to that that want to belong like that inner voice starts going what if they are what if they already know this stuff or with the song it's like what if you don't sound that good yeah. or what if you screw up if what if you make someone else look bad um no we i feel that every time every time if i'm doing a keynote and someone reads out they're reading out my bio before i go up or now online <laughs> my heart starts going um and so it's just understanding, and, and the trick is that our, our, we get this feeling that this is bad and we convince ourselves that's our intuition mm. telling us, so I, I have to not do this. And that's when you just have to kick in that the smart part of your brain and be like, no, no, I've, I've done this before. This is my expertise. Or maybe it's not, it's like, no, I don't know what I'm doing, but I wanna give this a shot. I wanna feel courageous and this seems like Good enough crowd they're going to be fine with this and even if they're not i'm going to be able to go to bed tonight and tick that box i'm proud of who i was today so yeah i basically if you're not out of your comfort zone you're not learning you're not growing so i do something scary every week uh, but what's important at least once a week but what's important is it can be tiny it could be um, i can drive this way to the store or i can drive that way which one feels slightly less comfortable I'm going that way. So it can literally be that small. It could be wearing your watch on your other wrist. It's yeah. just getting used to that sensation and pushing through it. That's a really interesting point. Um, it's almost like creating a habit of getting yourself 100%. out of your comfort zone and being comfortable with getting out of your comfort zone. Right, right. right. And knowing that you'll never be 100% comfortable. Otherwise, you're in your comfort zone. But yeah, accepting that this is the way, the only way I'm going to grow, the only way I'm going to learn, the only way I'm truly going to feel like I'm living my life to the fullest. So yeah, it's not going to feel great all the time, but there's a strategy to it. And that's that idea. Courage is um, doing something that scares you because of a bigger want. And that can help. It's like, if we're, if we're sort of held, I, I want to do, or I've got this opportunity. It's big. It's scary though. Do I do it? It's like, okay, what, what's the opportunity here? Um, and, and identifying what that is. And it'll still feel scary, but it's strategic courage rather than just do everything crazy that comes up and maybe get hurt. Just for the sake of doing it. There's, there's actual direction in uh, being able to then take that step and go to the next level. And yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Clarity really is for me, the driving force, right? And having a goal or having something in mind that you want to accomplish will help you get out of your comfort zone to be become the person that's required to achieve set goal. Right. And totally. um, that's, that's really awesome. Let's talk a little totally. bit about um, your book and how it uh, has prompted uh, some 
challenges for you and, and how you uh, got out of your comfort zone to write the book uh, that your comfort zone is killing you. Yeah, sure. Just let me stretch. <laughs> like, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm ready. There we go. So happen to have one right there. Um, so writing it was definitely challenging because after coaching thousands of people at the core of our fears is I'm not good enough and I don't matter. And so the writing a book is a huge, it's a million things that are writing a book is you're literally looking that fear in the face. So that was scary. Um, to be honest, what made it slightly less scary is I, I more or less took a year off work to write it. And my business at that point, at that point wasn't very profitable and it really stressed me out. So the book was kind of an excuse to not have to think about being profitable <laughs> And then I finished the book. I was like, oh, crap. Now I've got to go on a profitable business again. Um, but no, that part was scary. And then again, the, the standard stuff in our brain, like, what if I don't know much about this? What if everybody knows this stuff already? What if I can't make it make sense? What if I'm being too vulnerable? So I used to be the least vulnerable person on planet Earth. Because really? I felt like that's what a guy is supposed to be like. And that's how I'm going to get friends and be tough and all this in the book, I'm really vulnerable and honest in the book. Um, but is it going to be too much for people? And But then eventually it's like, no, I, I felt the need to write this book. Um, so then it's like, oh, whatever happens, happens. And people don't like me for it. Then ah, they probably weren't an authentic friend anyway. <laughs> uh, and you need six people to carry your coffin anyway. So, you know, I don't need a thousand friends. Uh, and not that that happened, but yeah, your brain goes, your brain just spirals, right? comes up with all these reasons oh no just play it safe there's lots of books out there who do you think you are <laughs> yeah yeah that's exactly what i experienced when i was going yeah through my book writing process cool. as well right and it's um that that worry that a there's already so many topics there's already so many books what what makes you special what what is it that that um that you can bring to the table that's different from anybody else and i really think um, the understanding for people that, that really have this desire to get something out that, that we, we realize that it's actually not us that's talking. I believe that it's honestly the universe speaking through us cool. and using our voice, our filter, the words and the experiences that we've had in the past to help relay that message to others. Cool. And that's where the resonation actually happens. And so taking yourself out of the equation, taking your ego out of the equation helps you kind of uh, take that step and, and go to that next level. Is that something that you, uh, that kind of fits with, with what you're looking at and, and how you speak about courage? Yeah. In terms of the, like the universe coming through you and yeah. Yeah. And what a, just a fun way to look at it, to consider it, right. Yeah. Consider that there's a bigger, there's a bigger reason for this. And even if you're writing about, like, it's not the book, first book on courage, let's be honest, but it's just my spin on it. And knowing that there's a reason for that, like there's, there's someone who's going to resonate with this spit, my spin on this topic more than someone else's because it's more similar to theirs. So yeah, it did. It, it felt like, it felt like a responsibility yeah. to write the book. That's yeah, it really perfect. did. Yeah. When it, when it becomes uh, something more than a desire it becomes a responsibility and you're serving those around you and your words are meant to help them create hope in their life create action create change and actually move in the direction that they're that you know is possible for them that's right. when you get out of your own way and you are able to go and help somebody take those steps and and actually finish the work that you have so for those people that are listening or, or watching right now um, if, if there is something that's lighting you up, if there is something that you feel like you need to do, whether it's a book, a podcast, whether it's starting a business or, or getting out of your job, keep in mind that if, if it's strong enough, it will shift from being a want to a desire to a responsibility. And that's where you can actually step out of your comfort zone a lot more comfortably, a lot more readily and be ready to take on that fear and be ready to take on that challenge. That's something I've personally experienced. That's something that uh, Billy speaks about in the book. And I really do think that there's uh, 
a real possibility, a real opportunity for everybody to be able to step out of that comfort zone uh, when the time calls for it. So mm -hmm. uh, what I want to kind of bring up next is um, let's, let's talk a little bit about actual strategies that people can take on uh, in the moment. What are some things that people can do when, when presented with uh, a stressor or some sort of challenge, something that, that scares them? What are the, the basic tools, basic recommendations that you can give to people, the top couple tips to overcome sure. that fear? Sure. So the first thing <clears throat> that we've already talked about is just under that overall understanding that just because this feels stressful or scary doesn't mean it's, it's, you don't do it. So first thing for me is if anything makes my heart pound, like someone mentions an opportunity and my heart pounds, it means I have to consider it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I have to do it because I want to be strategic, but it means I have to, I want to consider doing it. So just remembering, okay, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. And then a great coaching question is what might be good about this, right? Or what, so figuring out what might the reason be that I do this, mm -hmm. uh, a few deep breaths, hugely important too. But yeah, then it's, it's that strategy of connecting it to the person you want to be. So what might be good about this is the simplest first question or what might be a reason to do it. The other one on a deeper level, if you've got a bit more time to think about it, is to compare it to the person you want to be. And the, the easiest way in my opinion to do that is to compare it to your values mm. and your values um, are the way you want to live. It's the, the person you want to be. And if basically you don't, you shouldn't do anything that doesn't align with your values because your values represent the person you want to be. And so I think, okay, what, what, which of my values might this opportunity align with? Because then I'm taking the person I want to be and putting it into action. So will it help me align with, you know, freedom or fun or value to others or honesty or adventure. These are just my values. Um, and I carry them around in my Superman wallet. Those are my values there. And if I'm ever stuck or trying to decide, do I do this or not? It's, I look at the values. Okay. Oh yeah. It'll align with that. And that it aligns with this too, but I've already got enough of fun or simplicity lately. So that's less important, but I don't have as much discovery. And I would learn a lot doing this. Okay, so maybe I will go ahead and do it. That's the strategic way to, to be courageous. Yeah. And then, and then we also want to have a, try to have a realistic idea of what the risk is. So is this a career limiting move? It, and if it is, you ask your boss. If you, then you cover your butt kind of. If you don't have a boss, you think it over and you ask your friends, your colleagues, like, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? And Nine times out of 10, your brain will try to convince you it's going to explode and be horrific. And it just very rarely is. But if you do feel like, oh, I think this is a bit much, this is a bit too far out of my comfort zone, a bit too, too scary. And the next question is, what's a baby step of that? Mm -hmm. Because if it's scary, that means there's a chance to learn and grow. And if it's too big, that's okay. Then what's a baby, ver a baby step that you could then build up to that? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Breaking it down into smaller steps, making it something that's doable? What's the simplest um, path towards that? What's the first step you can take in the direction that. to achieve that final goal? Totally, the first step. And even if that first, first step is uh, open up your computer and research the topic, Yeah. then that's your goal for the day. Yeah, and build it from there. Yeah, love that. That's wonderful. I love it. Um, that's absolutely beautiful. I would love to talk a little bit about um, what are some of the challenges that can, can occur if somebody doesn't take on these challenges and, and what if they're living kind of away from their values? Um, you talk a little bit about mental health and, and struggles yep. that can come up in the mental health realm specifically. Um, talk a little bit about that if you don't mind. Yeah. So this stuff really applies to that. I mean, I think that there's, there's the person we want to be and that we are. And anytime we're not authentically being that person, like not doing what we want or not speaking up or anything like that, we're basically telling ourselves that who we are doesn't matter. Mm. Right. So if someone's like, Hey, um, we're going to go and do this. What do you think? And you disagree with that or you think it's unfair and you don't say anything. You're basically telling yourself that your opinion doesn't matter. And that just takes a toll. It really takes a toll. I want everyone 
to think they're just awesome, right? I'm, I'm awesome. You're awesome. We're not perfect. We're always trying to get better. But if we keep pushing down those, those wants and those needs, we're telling ourselves we don't matter. Um, a, it's a horrible role model for kid, for your kids, right? I mean, then they grow up seeing that too. They don't put themselves first enough. So I think that's, that's the big picture. That's what happens. And, and we know it, we can convince ourselves, oh no, I'm okay. Not doing that. Or just settling for this, not going for what I want. I'm okay with that. But at a, at a subconscious level, probably not even very subconscious. We know we're, we're giving up and we're cheating. We're cheating ourselves. Yeah. It just doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. And you can't live out of your comfort zone. You'd be a stress case. So time in your comfort zone is amazing and it's healthy to re reboot. But we know when we feel like we're playing it safe and we just, we know we're robbing ourselves. Yeah. And I think just to kind of build on that. Yeah, please do. I feel like it would have a real impact on your self-identity and, and oh, yeah. uh, have a very negative influence mm -hmm. on, on your self-worth and your confidence. If you constantly are uh, creating a habit of putting yourself last, putting your values behind and, and not speaking your truth, right? That's, that's where we get into these challenges of not feeling like ourselves. And we get into this almost depressive mode of totally. who am I really? And we start questioning is it me? Is it something else? What have I done wrong? What can I do better? Why am I not doing this right? What's wrong with me? And when we start right. saying what's wrong with me, we've really lowered our self worth or our confidence. And we play that, that major negative role on our overall um, identity and, and uh, totally. create that negative impact. So um, yeah, and that's you, crazy. Yeah. You hit a big word there, which is self worth. I mean, I think the two biggest problems in the world, these are my, this is just my opinion. Number one is overpopulation, which I can't do anything about. Number two is a lack of self-worth. Man, if we, people fight, people don't fight because they, someone did something to them. They feel like they don't have enough self-worth and there's that terrifies them. And then they get angry. If we had self-worth, we wouldn't argue. We wouldn't raise our voice. We wouldn't hate people. We wouldn't have prejudices. We wouldn't join gangs. We wouldn't, we wouldn't need to do any of that because we do all that to compensate for this sometimes a deep seated belief that I'm not, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of love. Um, and so when we don't stick up for ourselves, be the person we want to be, we're just building that up even more. And then the amount of resentment we get and we resent people that don't deserve it because they just shine a light on our own self resentment. <laughs> It's so, oh, it's so complicated. No, I would love it if, if people, this sounds a bit weird, but I'd love it if people were more selfish. And by selfish, I mean putting their values first. Because when we take care of ourselves and therefore our values, we show up awesome for everybody that we care about and everybody in the world. And when we don't, we build this resentment, um, which pays back 10 times worse. I absolutely love that reframe on selfish that it's not necessarily being selfish for your ego. It's being selfish for your values, totally. and what you stand for and what your identity is then tied to that. That is such a powerful reframe for people to understand that when you're doing something um, that aligns with you, it's not necessarily for you. You're not pushing yourself in a negative direction. You're not pushing yourself uh, upwards at the expense of others. It's, it's to promote your values and the things that you believe need to happen to create that optimal health, to create that optimal uh, end up point in your, in your life and where it is that you want to go in your life. Totally. And it's funny if you, like when I look at my 10 values, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them I can't align with them without someone benefiting. Mm. So I do it for me because then I'll show up. But like some of them are just for me, like simplicity, mm -hmm. maybe discovery, but like value to others, even yeah. fun and adventure. That's never just by myself. Like I'm bringing yeah. other people. So when we align with them, we feel great because we're living our, our true to who we want to be, but other people just instantly benefit. Um, but yeah, we have to have, we have to do it for ourselves as well. And that's what keeps us going. I absolutely love that you've got that card with you carrying around the card laminated 
with your values on it, knowing what it is that you want and, and always being able to kind of check back and say, yeah, this is aligning with, with that or this decision yeah. that, that I'm making or this opportunity that has come up aligns me with that value. Um, there's nothing stronger than having clarity on what it is that you want. And, and I love this practice of, of actually defining what your values are because then all of your decisions will follow accordingly. Even in our exactly. program handbook at Health Upgraded, um, it, I've, I've written out what our mission statement is and our yep. entire mission at Health Upgraded is to help people not have health challenges in their way so they can go out and create the change that they want to see in the world. Yep. And I've, I've listed off our core values and that really allows us to drive and make better decisions and say, no, this totally. doesn't align with what I want. And so I'm not going to say yes to this opportunity, but this one does. And this is actually going to be great for me to then take that step. And that's where then we can step out of our comfort zone, knowing that it is aligned with something more, with something greater. Totally. Because we want to make decisions based on fit, not fear. And when we look at the values, they help us see the fit and they, they help us take the fear out of it a bit. I've done this with a room full of a few hundred people and they've all done the values assessment. And it's like, think of a decision you're stuck on. Think of your main options how th now figure out how many of your values align better with one op option and how many of them align better with the other. So that now you've got a number and I say, put up your hand. If one of your options align with way more of your values than the other one, and every hand goes up and I say, keep your hand up. If that's the scarier one and every hand stays up. So our ego tries to convince us we're not clear. Mm -hmm. It's not the right time or we don't have the, the, the information and our values just show us, no, you know, which one you want to do. It's just scary. So you're we're coming up with excuses. That's spectacular. The, the clarity kind of just stops the idea of the ego being able to come in and, and wreak havoc on, on your ability to make those decisions. And I find uh, a lot of people that don't have that clarity, a lot of people that struggle in that sense tend to be really slow decision makers are unable to really make a quick decision and often need to sit down and think about it for hours and days on end before right. making a decision that they know is aligned with their values or that know that they know would get them forward or, or take them ahead. The problem is there's some struggle. There's something internal that they're battling. And it oftentimes is that ego. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that if we could, that internal struggle that, that tends to happen when we don't have that clarity. Right. Yeah, and again, it comes back to that, the childhood and the evolution. Because um, the ego, the ego just wants us to, to look good and to be right. And the reason we want to, I want that too, of course. The reason we want to look good and be right is because then I'll belong. Right, so it all just keeps coming back to that belonging. And even in that example with all the people that put their hand up and the one option, the scary, the one option that aligned with their values was scarier. Um, it's, it always has, it, there's the, the personal part of maybe I'll fail or maybe I'll look silly if I do it, but we're all intertwined in relationships, right? So it's usually more related to that. It's like, oh, if I do that, that might be great for me, but is that as good for my family? Or does it mean I have to say no to something and maybe upset somebody? Um, and because we're terrified of not belonging, we just don't want to do that. So yeah. there's the personal part. I might fail. I might look stupid, but even more, it's, I might have to, I might have to stand up to someone else or do something that someone doesn't or disappoint somebody. Yeah. And every, all your cave person DNA starts going off. Oh no, no, don't do that. You'll get kicked out of the tribe. No kidding. Yeah. The, the idea of belonging really just, drives so many of our decisions so so strongly but if we create that clarity to overcome that that need to belong we can make decisions that actually really benefit us and and move more quickly in our lives i know that's for been sure. a struggle for me uh, for a long time was being able to make a decision uh off the cuff and, and not knowing what the impact was going to be on family or on friends or on other things that were going on things that i I, I wanted to ensure it didn't get bothered. And so I would spend time thinking about these decisions a lot more uh, than I needed right. to. And finally, I would come up with a quick decision once in a while because I finally was clear on this is actually going to help or this is not going to help. And that clarity plays such a major role. 
for sure. And a different way to think about the belonging is um, like we belong to anything, a job, a romance, friendship, club, anything, as long as we contribute, mm -hmm. then they want us around. Yeah. So it's actually about how can I contribute more? It's not how can I belong more? Cause then we'll make not great decisions all the time or short term. It's like, how can I contribute more? Or what's my contribution? Cause if we contribute, we will always belong. And sometimes the contribution is harder, but cause it, it's going to be difficult but we know that's where our real contribution is going to be. So everyone in the room is talking about this great idea and you've got some information that, you know, this is a bad idea. It's scary to put up your hand because you feel like you might rock the boat and not belong, but you're, that's actually going to be your contribution. So how can any relationship and your job is a relationship too, that I think isn't going as well as it could be. Just ask yourself, how can I contribute more? And we don't want to, it's like so-and-so pissed me off. And the last thing I want to do is do more for them, but it's going to work. Yeah. I think a lot of people will stop themselves from disagreeing with certain uh, paths that are being taken in the group that they're with, or, or they'll stop themselves from, from contributing out of fear of uh, not then belonging or, or out of fear of, yep. of not showing up. But really, if you do show up, you're actually going to be able to create more of a sense of contribution and belonging rather than just being somebody in the background that doesn't actually um, bring, bring up their opinion, their peace. And, and totally. oftentimes those who are most highly valued in their groups and their societies are the ones that contribute, are the ones that challenge the status quo, are the ones that, that bring up new opportunities and are willing to to speak their mind and that's where uh, we really need to realize that if we truly want to belong we need to be questioning those yep. uh, those status quo and things that we we thought that we just kind of had to follow along with um, totally out of fear and if you if any relationship and again work is a relationship too where they don't want you questioning then that's a relationship you probably don't want to be in anyway. And if it's your family, you just got to put up with it. But any, anything else that is in your control, um, probably don't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do your best to take yourself out of that equation. And, and that aligns so well with what you were experiencing in your work, because it wasn't aligned with the values that you had. It wasn't, you weren't working to help promote the brands that you wanted to promote. You weren't feeling right. Um, in that right place and you were able to extract yourself from that situation so that really does bring us back to to living what you what you preach and practicing what you preach and i'm really glad that you were able to do that uh, i i think this has been a wonderful conversation thus far that's really, been fun <laughs> like we could go on for hours and hours i know right like all day <laughs> um i i do need to bring this down to an end because yeah. i don't think too many people are listening anymore because i keep <laughs> I would love to uh, talk a little bit about your book and your course and where can people find you? Sure. Um, so in terms of finding me just on my website, couragecrusade.com um, and your comfort zone is killing you is the book and it's on Amazon. Um, <clears throat> and then I've got a, an, if you don't love to read, I've got a, a video program that does the same thing, an online course. Uh, and it's an awkward URL. So I'll, give it to you and you can post it in somewhere yeah you can um, find it on, on the show notes and on our social media posts uh for the podcast perfect yeah. yeah so there's a few different mediums depending on what people's style is like absolutely yeah. the courage crusade yeah. course by the way i've had a chance to go through it myself and it's absolutely spectacular just wonderful awesome. in helping you create um some clarity in uh, setting up your values, understanding what holds people back and realizing that you really can't grow unless you pull yourself out of that comfort zone. And, and uh, I, I love that quote that courage can't come up unless you have fear. If, if you don't mind kind of repeating that, I've kind of paraphrased it in my own head, but you can't be yeah. courageous without fear in the way. Yeah. Literally just courage can't exist without fear. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Courage can't exist. No, it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us, Billy. This was absolutely wonderful. Uh, for anybody who's fun. listening, I uh, hope you had a wonderful time. Hope you learned a lot. Uh, like Billy said, you can find him on couragecrusade.com. Learn more about his work. 
and his book and course are wonderful. The book, like we, like you said, uh, your comfort zone is killing you. And um, we will be posting all of the um, URLs to get to the course, to get to the book as well on our show notes as well. All right. Awesome. Thank you so Thanks. much, Billy. Thanks for the chat, Doc. It was fun. Have a great day. All right. You too. See you, bud. Bye.